I'm Jennifer Manise with the Longview Foundation for Education and World Affairs and International Understanding. It's a super long name for a small foundation that works exclusively on integrating international perspectives into K-12 schooling here in the United States. Heather, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself and give us a word or two about the Asia Society. Sure, thanks Jennifer, and thank you also to our hosts at ACTE. Um, Asia Society is a nonprofit. We're based in New York City, but we have offices throughout the U.S. and throughout Asia. And our primary focus in our education work is to helping is to help ensure that K-12 students graduate ready for college and careers, and also globally competent. And I'll talk about what that means in just a minute. We also want to share some resources with you. One of the early pieces of advice ACTE gave us um, while preparing for this webinar was to include resources. So you can see that we've got a Google Doc link at the bottom of this slide, and you will want to go ahead and copy that URL exactly. Just write it down on a piece of paper right now if you want, and make sure you've got the caps in place, and I'm sure that you'll need the HTTP as well. We'd love for you to contribute to this document if you have ideas or resources, but at a minimum, it's a compilation and of ideas and things that we know and like. And that doesn't mean that you can log off and just go look at the resources now, but instead we'd love to get started and talk a little bit about what we mean when we talk about global competence. Okay, so for global competence, um, <clears throat> first just generally, we view, view that global competence is the possession of the knowledge, skills, and dispositions to understand and act creatively on issues of global significance. And so Asia Society worked with the Council of Chief State School Officers, CCSSO, to put together a detailed definition of what global competence is. And it was also officially adopted by the U.S. Department of Education as their definition of global competence recently. So here you can see, um, it's, the graphic is a bit busy, but if you look in the middle here, you can see the four pillars of global competence. And the first is investigate the world. So that is, we believe students must be aware of and interested in the world and its workings. And this ability involves formulating and exploring globally significant issues. Second is recognize perspectives. So students must recognize that they have a particular perspective and that someone else may or may not share it, but they can look at both sides and from that construct a new point of view. Third, global competence entails effective communication, both verbal and nonverbal, with diverse audiences. And we believe that globally competent students should be proficient in English because that is the language of business, but also in at least one other language, and that they should be able to use that language to collaborate across cultures. And they should also be skilled users of media and technology. And finally is the take action element, and this in some ways is the most important because this is where students are actually using what they've learned and applying it in real world situations. So at Asia Society, we've been working with schools across the country as well as districts and states to really integrate global competence into all aspects of education, from curriculum to professional development. So we really don't see this as an add-on class. Global competence is a piece of every curricular area, and it can help to engage students. Here you'll see um, a book that we have available as a free download on our website, asiasociety.org slash education, and it really goes deeper into this definition and also has examples um, from across the country on global competence, as well as from schools around the world that have been implementing um, global issues into their curriculum and professional development. So why do we think that global competence is important? And there are two main reasons. Um, the first has to do with the globalization of the economy. So to be fully able to take advantage of global market opportunities, companies must hire workers who are globally competent. And in part, this is because of the millions of existing and future jobs that depend on international trade. So states right now are realizing that they're no longer competing with the state next door, but with the world. Nearly 40 million U.S. jobs are tied to trade, but beyond that, three quarters of the world's purchasing power and 95% of all consumers lie outside of U.S. borders. So for companies to be profitable, they have to look to these foreign markets. And for every job that is created in a foreign country 
by a U.S. company, 2.2 new jobs are created back here in the U.S. So this demand for global competencies really reflects increasing opportunities for international collaboration within and across companies. And this slide shows um, a graphic from MappingTheNation.net, which is total billions of dollars of trade happening across the country. And so this is an interactive website where you can see how many jobs in your state and locally in your county are tied to international trade. And you can also see how many dollars flow through your state and county because of trade and what industries those are tied to. So that's um, MappingTheNation.net. Um, so it's really no surprise that employers are well aware of the value of global competencies to their bottom line, and they're increasingly citing it as a priority. And here are just two surveys um, that have happened recently that show this. Um, an Association of American Colleges and Universities study found that 97% of business executives identified intercultural skills as important, including 63% who believe that they're very important and 91% of them agreed that all students should have educational experiences that teach them how to solve problems with people whose views are different from their own. And the second survey, the U.S. Business Needs Survey, was of 800 U.S. executives, 80% of which agree that their business would increase if staff had international experience. And what I thought was really interesting about this survey was that they said that these international skills should be required at both the management and entry levels. So they're not seeing this as just something for management, but for all employees. The other main reason um, for students to be globally competent is that even if they're not working in a big multinational corporation, they're going to be working with people from different cultures right in their own backyards. One in 10 Americans is foreign born, and local communities, urban, suburban, and rural, are growing more diverse. About 20% of our population speaks a language other than English at home, and by 2060, more than a third of our population will be Hispanic. And these are more statistics that you can find on that MappingTheNation.net uh, website. So think in your head what Heather described with regard to the changes in both the demographics and the economy in the U.S., and then think about the career clusters and that definition of global competence. Take action, communicate perspectives, um, be able to integrate ideas into a broader perspective. Which of the common career technical core clusters would make the most sense? And we've been thinking about that and talking about that a lot with our organizations. And we've been doing some research as well. And consequently, we just wanted to share some examples of things that different schools, teachers, districts are doing around the country with regard to integrating global into their career technical education. Our first one is ag. But before we get to ag, I just want you to think for a minute. Where do you see that global competence definition most easily applying to your own work? Heather, do you want to go back to that pie slide just for a sec so that our audience can see it and maybe think and reflect just for a moment about which is the easiest? Is it investigating? Is it recognizing other perspectives, communicating ideas, and taking action? Some of these are so obviously well aligned to career technical education, and others of them may not seem so obvious. So let's talk about ag for a moment, agriculture. About a year ago, um, Asia Society and the Longview Foundation put together a survey for agriculture teachers across the country to figure out what examples of global agriculture education exist. We had almost 120 teachers respond, over half of whom had been teaching for more than 10 years. 94% of our respondents felt that global perspectives should be taught in classrooms, but over half didn't explicitly teach a global perspective um, within their units. Many of those that did actually had a few lessons or units that they taught, not a comprehensive integrated approach. The respondents overwhelmingly expressed a need for more materials to teach global ag and um, a listing for virtually every type of ag class currently being taught. Everybody found global components in every single one of them. And more than half said that they would be interested in assisting Asia Society and Longview with the creation of more lesson plans and resources. 
only 20 of that 120 said that they weren't really interested in doing more work in this area. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so agriculture, units with a global lens. We did hear from some teachers that are doing amazing work. Um, units around food and floral sourcing, that typical hamburger dissection unit that many ag students take on early in their careers, looking at the sourcing for each one of those products. One teacher took it further and looked at where things were in season and what the global implications for trade were and how easy or hard it was to put a hamburger together at any different time of the year. And that led to a further dialogue about food sourcing, security issues, trade issues, and as a result, the students started an initiative to encourage people in their communities to support local agriculture and reduce their carbon footprint. Um, another example um, that we get a lot from one of our colleagues is the Maine lobster trade. Um, Maine is up there against Canada, and you'd think that one of their largest lobster trading partners might be Canada, but actually it's France who loves to have lobster around the holiday season, and consequently lobstermen need to be able to understand how their product can be moved to France, what tariffs, what responsibilities they have on that end, and it's actually a very global business. Obviously, soybeans are another example of a very global crop. Lots of soybeans in Western Ohio, in North Carolina, and in other states around the country are actually sent to Japan where they're turned into tofu and then traded back to the United States. What does that mean for the soybean production and what sorts of soybeans will Japan accept? So even our local farmers are impacted, not to mention the huge agribusiness and um, the food security and resource issues that we're facing currently in the United States. Okay, and I wanted to share a little bit about the Global STEM Education Center, which is located in Massachusetts. And they're connecting classrooms in Massachusetts with classrooms around the world. And these aren't just superficial Skype connections. The students are working together with their international peers to conceptualize, design, and complete in-depth research and hands-on projects. So last fall, I visited Blackstone Valley Regional Vocational Technical High School, and they decided to offer this global STEM classroom program to their electrical and plumbing students which is a bit of an unusual decision. That's not usually the group of students you think of as doing these types of international collaborative projects, but they had plumbing students who were coming up with different projects that they could do with um, peers in Russia, and they were doing their in-depth research, and then they do a joint presentation. Um, so there will be students in person presenting to their peers, but on the screen next to them will be their peers in Russia simultaneously presenting with them. And so the results of this project are showing that students emerge confident, they're better able to communicate and work with others. And these are skills that will help them get good co-op placements and apprenticeships and be able to work directly with their future customers, whether they share the same culture or not. Business is another one that is kind of a natural fit for thinking about global. Not only are all of the currency markets and the trade markets and the multinational corporations to be considered, but then there's always the issue of etiquette across borders. And um, I couldn't help but put the Berenstain Bears. I don't think that there's a global version of the Forget Their Manners book, but um, maybe we should think about putting one together because manners matter a lot in business. And there is a project in Kentucky called the Amazing Global Marketplace, which is a business program in Jefferson County that allows students to become actively involved in the global marketplace by using simulated international business practices. Uh, the students are paired with different companies, mentor companies around Jefferson County, including Yum Brands, Papa John's, Mercer's, Cafe Press, as well as international folks that live in the community at large. The model combines experiences outside of the classroom with lessons plans delivered by teachers around topics including market research, global supply chain, contracts, business meetings, and negotiation. During the simulation, students get to practice and demonstrate cultural norms and international business etiquette, and it culminates in a great trade show where the kids get to go around and visit other companies and countries, um, adding to their resume as far as their experience goes as well. Okay, manufacturing. 
capturing. Um, this example comes from Sherwood High School in Oregon, where John Niebergall has developed an activity where students simulate global manufacturing by creating components to a product in geographically distributed locations and then shipping those parts to a single school for final assembly and testing. So he starts by introducing this idea through an initial activity where students look at the global sourcing of their clothes, their cell phones, their backpacks, whatever they have with them in the classroom that day. And then they learn about the global production lines of Boeing, which obviously is a multinational company where pieces are created in Indonesia or Ireland, and then they're sent to the U.S., to um, Washington State and South Carolina um, for assembly. Industry leaders also come into the classroom and they sort of reinforce this lesson by sharing their own experiences of working in international setting. And so the first time John did this project, students worked with a school in Sitka, Alaska. So the students in Sitka designed a set of gears and they sent those designs to Sherwood High School in Oregon. And those students manufactured them and then sent them back to Alaska for assembly. And so now they're trying to spread this project across the Pacific Northwest and across the US. And I think this is a great example of how you can teach these global concepts without having to go out and find a partner somewhere else in the world, but you can do it using your own domestic contacts that you already have. Sometimes, actually, those domestic contacts are a lot easier to build relationships with classrooms that don't necessarily look like yours. I know um, a district leader in Pennsylvania who, I'm not sure who's uh, a common core state that's on the webinar today, but I'm guessing there are probably a couple at least. And um, to prepare students and still sort of remain faithful to global, uh, they are actually Skyping their test prep and they've looked for students that come from a very economically diverse um, situation and, uh, um, and so they've looked for classrooms to match up where students get to actually work together over Skype in preparing for Common Core assessments with the idea that um, it definitely aligns to what needs to be going on in the classroom right now, but it also gives ch students a chance to interact meaningfully around work that is important with students that look and um, have different experiences than their own. Our last example is health and human services. Um, anybody who's been following the news over the past five months is no doubt up to speed on the fact that um, what happens in Africa has impact in the United States. The epidemic with Ebola in Sierra Leone and other countries and how that has translated into our own um, disease prevention and um, public health debate has been significant. And one school in Washington State, Health Sciences and Human Services High School in the Highline School District in Washington has really taken this on and wanted their students to have a sense of how global health is from the very beginning. So they started a semester of global health for freshmen and the teacher, Alicia Elmsley, uses a project-based learning approach to cover topics such as communicable and non-communicable diseases, uh, policies of the World Health Organization, major global, uh, global health problems, awareness and advocacy around issues and debates around interventions. The students get case studies and real-world problems and work together to evaluate the case, solve problems, and advocate for many different issues. And then they have the opportunity to present to their classmates before honing their work and presenting to other actual classes. The teacher thinks this early exposure to global issues broadens not only their understanding of the complexities of the field of health and human services, but also really builds their understanding of the career options because so many students come to health with the idea they want to be a doctor, they want to be a nurse having no understanding of how deep, wide, and broad the field is and how many different points of entry there are for a meaningful career in health. So those are just a few examples of different career clusters that we wanted to get your brains kind of wrapped around and thinking, oh, I could see applications to my own work. And we'd love it if you have questions to go ahead and type those into the chat box and we will be happy to take those. But we also wanted to step back a little bit knowing that not everybody has an entire unit developed around an amazing global marketplace or uh, world health issues. How does one get started in looking for meaningful connections to career technical 
work in their own programs. And, you know, there's a lot to consider. Is your administrator, is your school leadership supportive? Are there businesses in your community that already have a global footprint and might want to come in and talk about their experiences? You can look at also the community diversity as well on the mappingthenation.net website. It can tell you who lives in your in your county, um, where they come from, and what languages are spoken, and just can be a general resource. Um, there's also, I think, some really obvious comparisons that students can make around project work. Um, transportation, for instance. You know, we often look at Europe and their Eurorail system and envy their ability to move people from location to location relatively easy um, without straining their roads as much as we do. But did you know that Europe actually looks at the United States at our um, our freight network of railways and, and is quite envious of the, our ability to move freight around as easily as we do? So there's another opportunity for students to look in transportation at the strengths and weaknesses of different types of systems around the world and what the implications might be for the future of the field. Then, you know, what big issues exist in the industries within your career cluster? And is there an easy hook for what a global perspective might bring? A question, a future question, or a current issue? I think about um, the the dock workers over on the West Coast and all that's happening with the container ships, and that's a huge issue, and I'm not sure that it's one easily solved, but clearly the ability for the docks and freight and all of that to, to exchange more readily um, is, is a su supreme issue and one that we should be thinking about. So just getting started with a big issue, how does it relate to the career cluster that you work in? Are there champions in your building? Are there principals? Are there businesses? Is there a superintendent that might be supportive? And then um, I just those are just some ways to get started, doing some research about what's there and who's already excited about this potential. Do we have any questions from the audience? Not yet. <laughs> okay, well, let's go ahead to the next slide then. And maybe even the one. Oh, let's. Can we link to the um, to the table? Can you go live to the to the resource just so we can show what we've got here? Yep. No problem. Give me one minute. And I was actually while well, while we're waiting for that to come up, I was out visiting a high school yesterday that's um, in a planning year to become an international high school next year, and they have quite a few CTE programs. And so I was talking with a lot of the instructors who are just now thinking about um, ways to start integrating. Um, and so there's just taking sort of baby steps this year before they become a full international program next year. And so um, the horticulture teacher just had new. Um, garden beds um, being built and they're asking the students, they have a very diverse population and so the students are going to be planting an international garden with plants representing um, the different countries that they're from. Um, the uh, culinary instructor was having parents come in and demonstrate some um, cooking some different dishes from different countries. So they have a large Pacific Islander population. And so that was a very popular one with the students because they didn't know much about that um, culture. So they had um, a great time cooking some of those dishes. Um, so it's interesting how you can start sort of integrating these things, you know, one step at a time. The health sciences teacher was having students look um, through international newspapers to look at some of these global epidemic articles. So they were doing that with at the beginning of every chapter that they're doing now in school. We have, Jennifer, do you want to talk? Yep, Oops, we ahead. have actually um, the, sorry, the Google Docs up and available just to look at the resource and see what's here. Okay, great, thanks so much. Um, you can see that we've gone ahead and listed out the career clusters. And they are all there. And um, we've got some global topics that we've identified. And then to the right, we've identified some resources. And those are all hot links that will take you to some existing resources that already pertain exactly to the career cluster. 
And then if we keep going down, um, we've got a general resources list that's really just a whole bunch. There's the Mapping the Nation link that I mentioned and Heather mentioned as well. And um, folks that Longview and Asia Society have worked with that have great resources, they may already have some units for you. Um, primary Source and Pulitzer Center right there t um, come to mind as, as places that you can explore something around water and the implications of the water situation and um, droughts in different areas and compare and contrast. Um, iEARN is another one on this list where you can actually do project-based learning with classes around the world for a very low fee um, for an individual teacher to join. And you can actually connect up around soil erosion and find a school somewhere in South America and do some comparative analysis around soil erosion and um, have your students communicate back and forth via Skype. So we've really tried to think both within the context of the clusters so that you can um, get resources that are immediately relevant to the work that you do now, as well as general resources for you to explore maybe during spring break when you're putting your feet up and thinking about uh, between now and the end of the year and how you might be um, able to integrate some of these ideas. Um, our advice is always start with one idea and move from there once you've had a chance. Uh, our, our horror would be if you felt like we thought you wanted to do everything all at once, but rather just to start with one and see how it goes, pilot it, and talk to a colleague about it. And sometimes the most infectious way to have something like this spread is by peer-to-peer -peer influence. And we hope that you will have the opportunity to use what we've started and add to it. And we'd love to hear from you with regard to what works, what doesn't work, and um, ideas that you've already be, been putting into place in your classrooms. And we'd just love to connect and continue to grow the passion for this work in career technical education. And again, we're so grateful to ACTE for their sponsorship of this website and for our continued collaboration. Heather, I'm gonna let you go ahead and sew us up. Okay, well, as Jennifer said, we would love for you to add to um, the table, um, and the link is back up here, um, so make sure you go visit, um, add to the resources, add to the ideas on global topics, and feel free to reach out to us for additional ideas. Um, and here we have um, just a few of our websites um, in case you want to connect directly with us. Um, anything else, Jennifer? I don't think so. Just thanks everybody for taking the time on a Wednesday afternoon to uh, listen in and we really hope to hear from you with regard to how things are going and we look forward to presenting your work on some future webinar. So thanks very much everyone. Thank you. And thank you again to our two speakers, um, Heather and Jennifer, you guys are you both absolutely amazing. Thank you for coming out today and, and presenting for us all. And um, for our attendees, if again, I know some people might not be hooked up to the audio, if you'd like to use the chat box, the Q&A to ask any questions, we'd be more than happy to answer them. If you're encountering, again, any technical difficulties, please let me know. And also, this recording will be available on ACTE's YouTube page. We will also share it on our social media accounts and on ACTE Live which is on our official website. If you'd like more information or share this with your friends, and um, we'll also be sharing, I know, the Google Docs link as well. So um, everyone, if there are no further questions or concerns, thank you for coming out today. We greatly appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon and rest of the week. Thank you.